يا رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا لك الحمد والشكر كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم إنا نعوذ بك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I hope inshallah everybody is well uh, It's a bit cold today but inshallah ta'ala start warming up MashaAllah ta'ala it's so good to see you again and in this blessed gatherings of the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we are at about the 11th year of the beginning of da'wah of the beginning of the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu so he is now 51 years old and for 10 years in Mecca he has been inviting to Allah ta'ala initially in the first three years it was secret in secret and then we saw after the Isra wa Mi'raj after the night journey and the ascension to the heavens he came back and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened for him uh, da'wah to various people so he started going to the, he started giving da'wah openly however he was still being rejected alayhi salatu wassalam and sometimes the most difficult test you see, it's sometimes only a few sentences he will say when he gives da'wah. He will read one ayah or he will say one or two things and that's it. Right? And this is what we can learn from Rasulullah sallallahu As he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَا وُجِلَ اللِّينْ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَا وَمَا نُزِعَ مِنْهُ إِلَّا شَانَا اللِّينْ يعني لطافه Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says whenever softness and gentleness is found in anything it gives it weight and beauty and whenever harsh hard, hard, whenever hardness right and uh, harshness is found in anything it makes it ugly and heavy even when you're giving somebody da'wah to Allah Taala, if your approach is obnoxious, they will feel it. But if, you, if, you, if your approach is jameel, and he gives him da'wah, he invites him to Islam. Suwayd ibn Samad listens, and he says to Rasulullah Sallallahu Inna hadha al-kalam hasan. He says, he says, what you say is beautiful. Walladhi ma'i, but then in this case it is وَالَّذِي مَعِي أَفْضَلْ مِنْهِ But then he says to Rasulullah Sallam because Suwayd ibn Samad was a well-recognized person among his community of Khazraj in Medina and he was nicknamed by his tribe Al-Kamil the perfect he was a very handsome man beautiful in his speech and beautiful in his appearance and because he was erudite, he was eloquent in the way he spoke, and he was handsome in the way he dressed, they called him Al-Kamil. He was the perfect fella, the perfect guy. And he was very eloquent. And he was very wise among his people. And so when Rasulullah Wasallam invited him to Islam, he says, but I have better. And Rasulullah Wasallam says, what better do you have? And he said to him, I have the wisdom of Luqman alayhi salam. The remnants of whatever Luqman alayhi salam. He, he's the haq, he has haq, he has the Quran. He could have responded by saying, nonsense. I'm not interested in this stuff. This is how we would have probably responded. Right? But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, I'radhu alayhi. Tell me what do you have? If you claim you have something better than I do, what is it? And I found that to be quite amazing actually. 
Because one, Rasulullah Sallam is in a sense showing respect, recognizing and listening. And he's not disparaging the man. That's a common, he didn't say nonsense. Because Rasulullah Sallam, remember he has the highest of adab. The highest of adab. And when you have the highest of adab, that adab would manifest itself whether you are speaking to a Muslim or non-Muslim, to an enemy or a foe or a friend. That is the adab. And that's why they say when Salah, when uh, when Richard the Lionheart one day heard that Salah Din was camping outside Jerusalem, he thought, "I will, I will attack him by stealth, by surprise." Uh, uh, Richard the Lionheart. He said, I will attack Salah din by surprise, right, so that I may kill him. And so he did go and attack. He found out from his spies where Salah din was camping. So Richard the Lion High takes his uh, cavalry, his uh, horsemen, and goes to attack Salah din but of course does not, could not uh, kill Salah din nor attack him. But in, in doing so, Richard the Lion High lost his horse. His horse died. He was killed. And then Richard the Lionheart went back to his camp and Salah al-Din went back to his camp. But look at the Adam of Salah al-Din. This is a man who came to kill him. Salah al-Din sent him a horse as a gift. And he said, it is not becoming of a king to be without a horse. Have a horse. <laughs> Ajeeb. And then later we know that factually that when Richard the Lionheart became very ill, Salah al-Din sent him his best physician. Is the lofty standards of a, the adab of a Muslim. They say when others lower their standards, you must never lower yours. Because Islam, what Islam does is gives us standards. And if others lower them, you don't lower those standards. So this man says to Rasulullah, I have better than what you have. He says, What do you have? He says, Suhuf Luqman. He says, The scripture of Luqman or the remnants of Luqman. He says, read it to me. Tell me what do you have? So he does. Then Rasulullah says to him, what I have is better. Fair enough. He says, I've listened to you, but what I have is better. The man also being munsif, being fair, he says, then you read to me what you have, O Muhammad. So Rasulullah recites to him from the Quran. And he says, Quran, he says to him, this is a Quran, anzalahu Allah alayya, huwa hudan wa nur. He says, this is the revelation Allah has sent to me. It is guidance and it is light. He says, read to me. So he read. So the man said, wallahi, what you have is better. What you have, O Muhammad, is better. Now, what the historians say, we don't know if he there and then he did not accept, he did not take the shahada, this uh, Suwaid bin al-Samit. But he accepted. He says, what you have is better. And left. He said, let me go back to my people. He went to Medina and his people said that we know that he died as a Muslim. He would have gone back, thought about what Rasulullah wasallam told him and took, accepted Islam and then died as a Muslim before even seeing Rasulullah wasallam. And the same thing happened to some uh, Mecca to Medina, Rasulullah wasallam now approached them to give them da'wah. And then he goes to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam فَأَتَاهُمْ فَجَلَسَ إِلَيْهِ فَقَالْ هَلْ لَكُمْ فِي خَيْرٍ مِمَّا جِئْتُمْ لَهُ Now this, this uh, Iyas bin Mu'ad, he came to look for allies in, Mac in, Medi in Mecca. Why? Because there was dispute between Al-Aws Al-Khazraj, the two tribes of Medina, between Al-Aws Al-Khazraj, there was historical dispute that, that remained, it almost broke them to, to, to pieces. And Iyas bin Mu'ad was coming to see if he could get some allies from Mecca. And then Rasulullah hears of his coming, he goes to him and he says, he says, I have, I have something better than what you are looking for. He says, I have something better than what you are looking for. 
قالوا قال وما ذاك؟ they said what is this that you have? what better do you have for us O O Muhammad? قال أنا رسول الله. he said I am the messenger of Allah. بعثني إلى العباد. he sent me to his slaves. أدعوهم إلى أن يعبدوا الله so that I might invite them to worship Allah. ولا يشركوا شيئا ولا يشركوا به شيئا and that they, not, that they should not associate anything with Allah. وأنزل علي الكتاب and he revealed the book unto me, the Quran. And then he mentioned about Islam and read some Quran to them. فقال إياس بن معاذ وكان غلام حدث هذا والله خير مما جئتم له. This Iyas ibn Mu'ad was, was still a young man. Uh, but as he heard to what Rasulullah was saying, he said, Wallahi, this is much better than what we have come for. It is also said that Iyas ibn Mu'ad left, went back to uh, Medina, and it wasn't until later that he had converted to Islam and died as a Muslim. His people said, Wallahi, we, all we could hear from Iyas ibn Mu'adh is that towards the end of his life is that he would be saying, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. But still, this da'wah to those individuals had, did not have the impact that Rasulullah was looking for. And the impact that Rasulullah was looking for is an opening in Medina. He wants an opening in Medina. Mecca, 10 years now, 11 years. And he was waiting, he was looking for an opportunity. And this is the, this is the mizaj or the mentality of a da'i. A da'i that never gives up. Because you just never know where hidayah is going to fall. You don't know. That's why the ulama, they say, they say, your job and majib is to make effort of da'wah. You, your job and majib is to invite to Allah in the most beautiful of fashions. But it is not your job to whom hidayat Allah gives. That is not your job. In Allah yahdi may yuhib, Allah gives hidayat to those whom he, he to those who, in Allah, in Allah, which is the ayah? In Allah la yahdi man ahbabt. Inna ka lan tahdi man ahbabt, walakin Allah yahdi may yasha. Jazakallah khair. That Allah, that you cannot give hidayat to the ones you love. Allah says to his messenger, you can give hidayah. Sometimes, you know, especially when if you have a father or a mother or a brother or a sister who are very close to you, obviously, whether Muslim or a new Muslim. And if they are not Muslim, then you have that urge and that eagerness and that desire and that burning desire in you. How can Allah Ta'ala give him hidayah? And sometimes that pushes some of our brothers and sisters to go and approach their family in ways that can make it worse. But also if a born Muslim, if you're a Muslim, sometimes you see young brothers who are not practicing Islam, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them hidayah, brothers or sisters, then Allah ta'ala gives them hidayah, but the father or the mother or the brothers and the sisters in the house, they're still not practicing Islam. They're Muslim, but they're not, there is no salah and so forth. And the ulama often always say, this person's approach with his parents, especially with the parents, should be very, very wise and gentle. Because you have to remember, you are the child after all. And your da'wah to your parents has to be very gentle and has to be very compassionate. And you have to look for the right time. The opposite happens. Sometimes young people become so zealous when they start it now. They get dean in their life, they read one or two books, or they listen to some lectures and they now become excited. And they go home, and this is true, it has happened. And if the father is not making salah or the mother, they will go to the extent of actually calling their father or mother a kafir. Or screaming at their father or mother. Right? Or not, they say, I can't respect you anymore because you're not making salah. And this is all the wrong approach. It's absolutely the wrong approach. A da'i, somebody who invites to Allah Ta'ala, more important than the words that are uttered from the mouth, more important than that, is the compassion that's in the heart. That if you truly want somebody to come close to Allah Ta'ala, you must truly have that compassion in your heart and make lots of du'a for them. 
and do whatever it takes, such as giving gifts, inviting them to meals, ikram, generosity. Uh, Nabi sallallahu says, tahadu, tahabu, give gifts and Allah will create love between you. Sometimes it's not words that bring people to Islam. It's not words that bring somebody back to deen. It's your conduct. It's your dua. It's your character. It's your behavior. As in the case of Rasulullah after one ghazwa, one battle, one expedition, he had acquired so many, uh, a large herd of sheep as, as ghanima, booty. In fact, a valley for him. Can you imagine a valley between two mountains full of sheep? And he was standing, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, looking into the valley, looking at those sheep. And there was a mushrik chieftain, a mushrik who was one of the chief of the tribes. Mushrik is not a Muslim. He's standing right next to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as Rasulullah Sallallahu was looking at the, the heads of the sheep, the herd, he could notice, that he noticed that this non-Muslim, this mushrik, is equally looking at the herd of sheep with a sense of excitement. So Rasulullah said to him, what do you think of the herd of sheep? He said, amazing. He said, do you like it? He said, I do. He said, it's all yours. Just like that. It is all yours. Take it. He said, are you kidding me? He said, no, I'm not kidding you. It's all yours. He looked at Rasulullah sallallahu He says, Wallahi, nobody does this but a prophet of Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. That's it. Sometimes, that's why the ulama who are involved in da'wah, they say ikram, being generous, hospitable, sending somebody a gift, inviting him to a meal, without having to say anything, can sometimes be more, more powerful than the words that you speak. That's why they also, those ulama who are very experienced in da'wah, they say there are four, you should, there are four stages before, you know, before you pick the fruit. The first, they say ta'arif. You need to get to know the person. Ta'arif means knowing the person. So you build a relationship so that the person knows you and you know them before you give any da'wah. That ta'aruf then would lead to mahabba. It would lead to a sense of they like you and you like them. Because of your approach, because of your character, because of your smile, because of your du'a, because of the meal you invited them to. And this is whether he or she are a Muslim or not Muslim. Whether a non-Muslim who is not practicing or a non-Muslim who is not, not, not Muslim. Then when there is, it's a natural thing, it's a natural disposition. Psychologically now if I like you and you like me, there is a level of trust. So then they say trust is built. When there is trust, when there is a level of trust between people, they are willing to listen. They are willing to listen. When they are willing to listen, it's easier to give da'wah. And what is more powerful in fact is, not, is that not you going, sometimes people come to you and say, tell me about Islam. That is more powerful because they come to you wanting to hear, to listen. So then the beginning of the opening of Medina, if we can talk about Fath of Mecca, one could possibly also talk about Medina, the opening of Medina. And this is when a group from Khazraj, and in this case, there were uh, 12 of them, 12 men who came to Mecca, and Rasulullah ﷺ went to meet them in Al-Aqaba, which is in Mina. If anyone has been to Hajj, you know where Mina is. Of course, Mina is big. This is now the 11th year. So Rasulullah Sallam hasn't given up. He's still trying. In the 11th year, a 12 men from Medina come, but now something interesting and something different. The composition of these 12 men was interesting. Remember, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj were enemies. 
But in this case, 10 of those men were from Al Khazraj and two were from Al Aws. And both have come for the same reason. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, goes to them. And among them was Uqba ibn Samit or Ubad ibn Samit al Khazraji radiallahu anhu. And he is narrating. He says, I was of those 12 men and there were women also who come later. I was of the 12 and so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa met us. And this is called Al-Aqab Al-Ula, the first Aqaba. And he gave us this da'wah. And notice how brief, how simple, but how powerful. He said to them the following, if you were to accept Islam, then you will you'll make bay'ah on the following. Allah to shirk billah. That you do not commit shirk with Allah. Wala nasrik. He told us that you don't commit shirk. You do not steal. Wala nazni. And do not commit zina. Wala naqtul awladina. And that we should not kill our children. You know, they used to kill the daughters, particularly because they saw daughters as a liability. Wa'dil banat. They used to bury their daughters alive sometimes. Because sadly, and this is unfortunately, is still in to, in to some extent, not a large extent, a prevalent mindset among some people that in some cultures that they want, when they, they want a boy child, not a girl, for example, right? They think a boy is not a liability, a girl is a liability. And of course, of course Islam came to reshuffle that and, you know, reshuffle the status quo because they used to bury their daughters alive, alive feeling they're a liability, they're a burden. And, and this is when Allah wa ta'ala came and prohibited that. And He said, on the day of Qiyamah, al mawuda the girl who was buried alive will be questioned. Why did you kill her? For what purpose did you kill her? And Rasulullah came with beautiful teachings about the value of having a daughter. And he said, for example, if Allah Ta'ala gives you one daughter or two daughters and three daughters, and you look after them and you raise them well, then you and I will be in paradise like this. And he, uh, he joined his index finger and middle finger to say, you and I in will be in paradise like this. And so they said, وَلَا نَقْتُلْ أَوْلَادَنَا وَلَا نَأْتِي بِبُهْتَانٍ نَفْتَرِيهِ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِينَا وَأَرْجُلِنَا And that we must not slander. وَلَا نُعْصِيهِ فِي معروف, And that we must not disobey the Messenger of Allah in anything good. Then he said to them, And if you were to do that, فَلَكُمُ الْجَنَّةِ Then for you is Jannah. But if you were to go against any of that, this is between you and Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. إِنْ شَاءَ عَذَّبَكُمْ If He decides He can punish you, وَإِنْ شَاءَ غَفَرَ لَكُمْ And if He wants, He forgives you. The twelve took shahada. Ten from Khazraj and two from Aws. That you don't associate partners with Allah, you don't steal, you do not commit zina, you don't kill your children, you do not commit slander, you don't disobey Rasulullah sallallahu and if you were to do this, for you is Jannah. Now what you'll see later, when he was doing the same, this is called bay'ah. Now he, they made bay'ah with Rasulullah meaning they took a promise with Rasulullah or they call it an allegiance. An oath of allegiance. That is what bay'ah means. An oath of allegiance. In this case, it's an oath of allegiance with Rasulullah sallallahu but all of us, we have an oath of allegiance with Allah wa ta'ala and with His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Right? And if we were to fulfill that oath, or that bay'ah with Allah and His Messenger, as Rasulullah sallallahu said to those people, He says to us, for you is Jannah. And if you were to go, if you were to have shortcomings and if you have to sin, then Allah ta'ala says between you and Allah, if He wishes He can forgive you, or if Allah Taala can punish you. And of course we hope, hope in Allah Taala that 
he forgives us when we commit sin. Those 12 were now the beginning, the ulama say, and the historians say, this was the beginning of the opening of the world. Small in number, but do not underestimate what is going to happen next. And others describe it saying, this is the beginning of the rise of Haq and the fall of Batil. Others said this is the beginning, it is the crossroad and the beginning of the change of history and civilization and humanity. Rasulullah sends them back to Medina, but he sends with them a young man who plays a pivotal role in da'wah in Allah Azza wa Jal. And this man goes to Medina a year or two years before Rasulullah By the time Rasulullah got to Medina when he did the Hijrah, Islam had already entered almost every house of Medina. And this young man becomes known as the first ambassador of Islam. The first Safir of Islam. And he was none other than Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. Mus'ab, if you recall, maybe three, four months ago, we mentioned his story. I know if I ask you what you ate yesterday, you probably don't know. I don't know. But, and so if I was to ask you if you remember the story of Mus'ab, of course you will know. Because Mus'ab is Mus'ab. How can you forget Mus'ab radiallahu anhu? But just to remind you, Mus'ab was that spoiled young man of Mecca. He was a very spoiled young man of Mecca. He's the one who used to dress in the most beautiful clothes. And he used to apply the most beautiful of perfume. Remember Mus'ab? Can you smell the fragrance of Mus'ab? Mus'ab used to walk in the streets of Mecca. And after he would leave, depart the pathways where he walked, people would come after and they say Mus'ab was here. Because of the beautiful fragrance of Mus'ab. And spoiled brat. Literally, he says, I would wake up and breakfast is there next to my head. Mus'ab radiallahu anhu. Until Iman penetrated his heart and he took shahada and became Muslim. And who opposed him the most? The mother. Because that's his test. Right? That is a test. Allah Ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Ankabut at the beginning, do those who say we have Iman think they will not be tested? And we tested those who came before them to see who is truthful and who is not. Mus'ab was tested by his mother. But in this case, the mother did something absolutely horrendous. She said to him, if you don't give up Islam, I will starve myself until I die. And she did that for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. Of course, she could not continue after that. But he wouldn't give up because there is no room for give up, giving up here. And this is if we learned one thing from the seerah of Rasulullah is that there are issues that there is where you do not compromise. There are certain things there is no room for compromise. And there are other things that there is room for compromise. The areas in which there is no room for compromise, Tawheed, belief in the oneness of Allah, or giving up anything that is fard. If Allah said do it, it's fard compulsory, you do it. Even if your father or mother tell you not to do it, you cannot obey them. Because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, لا طاعة في مخلوق لمخلوق في معصية خالق. There is, yes, be respectful to your parents. Yes, show excellence towards them. Yes, honor them. Yes, then look after them. But if they ask you to go against a command of Allah, this is where you draw the line. Say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. 
because the Prophet ﷺ says that you cannot obey a creation if they ask you to disobey Allah, regardless of who this creation is. And that's what Mus'ab said, Mom, if you want to kill yourself, that's your problem, but I will not give up on my Islam. And because of his stance, because of his standing for his principle, she took everything away from him. That spoiled young man who would wake up and find breakfast next to his head now has nothing. Not even enough clothes to cover his body. So much so that he would walk in the streets of Mecca and Rasulullah would see Mus'ab and cry. And he says, look what has happened to Mus'ab. Because of his love for Allah Ta'ala. But then fast forward now, eight, nine years later, and Allah rewards him in the most beautiful of ways. You just have to have sabr. Be patient. Remember when, you, when Allah tests us, we are being tested, not Allah. And Allah Ta'ala determines the length of that test. What is required of you and me is to be patient. And this is one of the signs of the love of Allah Ta'ala. True love of Allah is when you are tested, you are patient. And you don't have, regardless of how long it takes, but wait, wait. The Arabs say, A true victory is an hour of patience. Just be patient, wait, just wait for it. And fast forward, Mus'ab now is given the, one of the most significant roles in the history of Islam, to be the first ambassador of Islam to Medina. Allahu Akbar. And what a man! He resides in Medina for one full year before Rasulullah goes to him. And in Medina he goes to every house giving them da'wah to Allah. By the time Rasulullah gets to Medina, almost everybody had become Muslim. All in whose account? Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Mus'ab ibn Umayr. What we will see next week, inshallah, we will look at some of the da'wah of Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Look how he also gave da'wah. And the people who accepted Islam in the hands of da'wah. But then it was, it's not until we go to the battle of Uhud that you will see what also happens to Mus'ab ibn Umayr. The story of one man, how he started, what Allah gave him and how he ended. رضي الله عنه. May Allah Ta'ala give us the tawfiq to have the qualities of those people and to give us the patience and perseverance when we are tested to withstand the test and to, with hope, to hold tight to our deen and iman not to succumb to our own desires and the desires of society and people who don't want us to obey him. وصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى سيدنا محمد سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خيرا